This is Derek O'Fodder and well with the Medicine Shell and today I'm going to answer the question of what the Osu system is and how it came to be. This is without question my most challenging video. It required a series of interviews with Nzes and Bibias, researchers, and just about any individual who was willing to speak on the taboo topic. It required days of reading just about any text available on the subject, and hours of internal and external debates, which finally told me that this video needs to be different. The more I read, the more vast the subject became. The more I studied, the less clear things were. And somewhere in my journey, I realized that I could not speak on the subject of the Osu without going into the subject of the Igbo people and Igbo history as a whole. To know what the Osu system is, we're going to go back as far as possible, because in the end, that is where I found my answer. I started this project thinking I can tell the story by looking at the world today, but by the time I found an answer, I was in the Stone Age. Before I start, I'd like to share that my resource library is now open to my patrons. I have hundreds of ebooks, articles, and studies from researchers, DBAs, and subject matter experts on Igbo spirituality, culture, and history, all organized by subject. You can access it by becoming a patron of The Medicine Shell at patreon.com slash themedicineshell. Donate what you can and what you're comfortable with. Um, all donations go towards keeping this channel going. And if you're not able to support through Patreon, you can support by sharing this video and subscribing, as well as simply hitting the like button below. There's a very strong case to make in saying that the most important ideological principle for social organization in Igbo culture is equality. Nearly all things from politics, warfare, spirituality, and even economics are organized to strive for balance by principle between both sides of any line drawn in the sand. For every privilege given to man, there's a parallel privilege given to women. For every right exclusive to a native, there is a balance principle given to a guest. And even deities are not seen as superior to humanity in this cultural context. And the relationship between humanity and the divine is a unique partnership of two equal and consenting partners. This is enforced through establishing the balance of power in all diametric relationships, as well as an emphasis on autonomy of all parties involved. So how does this culture become home to a system of segregation, isolation, and culturally reinforced and balanced today. A label branded onto an individual at birth and a groupthink that aims to declare the individual unworthy by birth alone. A system that places neighbors and friends on two sides of a line drawn to be unequal, unbalanced, mysterious, and deadly. Until today, nobody knows why. The Osu system is a social and spiritual construct that separates society into two camps. One is the Diala, which is well understood. They are the majority citizens of the land, with access to all spheres of life. The other are the Osu, who are not understood at all. Few can tell you who they are, how they came to be, or even what the word means. You cannot physically or even culturally distinguish Osu from Diala. There are no Osu exclusive names, there's no look, attire, or even culture standing today that designates one from another. The origins of the grouping is an absolute mystery, a classification in society which everyone understands how they are regarded, but nobody knows why, until now. The Osu system has been a feature that Igbo culture, from leaders to thinkers, have been dedicated to ridding itself of for decades. Almost all academia on the subject has been oriented towards finding a solution. Traditional leaders, as well as politicians, year after year make declarations to abolish the system as a relic of the past with no place in today's world. In 1956, four years before independence from the British, and inspired by a wave of Pan-African anti-oppression ideology, which was the current in the then Eastern Nigerian government, a law was passed outlawing the Osu system, declaring the society egalitarian and against all forms of what it defined as slavery. From that day forward, slavery, in all its representations and forms, was illegal in Eastern Nigeria or the Igbo region today, with the Osu system being the primary target of the legislation. In the summer of 2020, a man and a woman were caught lying in bed with each other in rural Lokija, both young and dead. Next to them was a canister of insecticide, and the following note, racism in disguise. How can we separate after six solid years of dating and getting so used to each other? How? We've always wanted to spend the rest of our lives together. We've always planned our future together. We've always been abolished in other villages. The people of Okija choose to live in the past as a result of ignorance. God created everyone equally. So why would human beings discriminate just because the ignorance of our forefathers? Why will we keep suffering for what we know nothing about? For something we didn't do? Why do we still choose to stay in the dark? 
This is racism in disguise. Yet we want to be treated equally in the white man's land. Charity begins at home. We've made up our minds to end it all because we can't stay with each other. Ndiokija, say no to Osu caste. I personally cannot tell you what the Osu system is categorically because that is not understood. What I can tell you is my own theory and present you with the evidence and knowledge that brought me to where I am. Because I strongly believe that in my studies and personal experience, even my family history, that I've made a breakthrough in contextualizing the system that'll give answers that most have not considered, seen, nor heard. This will not only require looking into the cosmological roots of our spirituality, law, and ethics, but also the history of the land itself from the beginnings of human culture till today. And most importantly, I welcome anybody to challenge the theory I present at the end of this video as a regular dialogue and debate is necessary to refine the truth at the core of all the theories presented. When you ask the question, what does Osu mean? The three most common answers you receive are the Osu are slaves, the Osu are outcasts, or the Osu are a priestly caste. And at the end of this video, we should know which one of these theories is true. The story of the Osu cannot be told without going back to the origins of human history. To date, archaeology has life in Igbo land beginning in the mystery hillsides and groves of Uguele Uturu. In 1977, and again in 1981, Archaeologist F.N. Nanozier was led by a group of locals to a mysterious pile of artifacts that would change the telling of human history. In a cave they sat, piled six meters deep, flawed axes which constituted 80% of the find, as well as picks, cleavers, and spearheads, all made from the abundant dolerite stone in the area. Their imperfections gave them identity, each spear and axe only having in common the fact that they were broken or forged incorrectly. Based on carbon dating, Anose was able to classify the site as the oldest evidence of human life in West Africa and the Sahara, and it has been theorized that the petroglyphs give insight to the beginnings of human culture in the coastal Niger region. The site at Uturu appeared to be early evidence of standardized mass production, and this cave theorized to be a dumping ground for defective stoneworks, with better form specimen being taken to another site. After carbon dating the stoneworks and matching it with styles around the world at the time, it was established that the axes, spears, and cleavers date back to 100,000 BC. To know the significance of this date, we have to zoom out and see what was happening around the world at 100,000 BC. This era marks the beginnings of human life leaving the African continent. As prior to this era, modern Homo sapiens were exclusive to Africa. The Sahara Desert was still a fertile forest. The woolly mammoth dominated the Eurasian steppe, and the first evidence of human clothing date to this era, as well as body adornments in the form of seashells used as jewelry found in what is now Morocco. The world's oldest stone structure, built in Walid Halfa in the Nubia region of Sudan, is also from this era. And in this age, there is no Stonehenge, there are no Great Pyramids, nor Wall of China. But the key components for human culture and civilization were beginning to bud. According to Unze Chukuka Dibia Nwafo, author of Leopards of the Magical Dawn, our Dibias mark this age as Ogachi. This is the era of human development where mankind begins to see itself as separate from nature. As the link between human and Mother Earth begin to break, human beings develop a separate identity, not only with the world around them, but from each other. In an effort to re-establish their fading oneness with nature, or to preserve what little connection remained, human beings began to build Arushi. In Igbo cosmology, the elements of the universe, as well as human beings, have an ethereal as well as a physical presence. This ethereal presence is known as Mo in human beings. Mo is a residual spirit double. It is a spiritual remnant of your existence in a quasi-immortal capsule of a person and the effect they have on others and the things around them. All things possess Mo, and in superhuman elements or elements that predate humanity, such as the earth, the sun, moon, or bodies of water, this concept is known as Abara. As human beings grew distinct from nature, they established complexes or proto-machines in order to tap into the Abara of a universal element to assure their own survival. These altars or shrines are known as Arushin. A functioning Arushi is an interface with the Abara or Mo of an element of the universe, or a deified ancestor. To best understand the concept, think of the Arushi as a cell phone and the Abara as the internet. Today, as it was then, the Arushi are built for three main purposes. The first is for Ogun, or science and medicine. The Arushi are built in part as a complex for teaching and preserving medicinal discoveries, as well as appealing to the Abara that the Arushi is used in contacting to inspire or reveal more natural healing secrets. 
In Ebo cosmology, the properties of the natural world can be revealed or uncovered through appealing to the Agbara of the natural elements that the medicine comes from. The second is legacy preservation. An Irishi is a storehouse of community heirlooms and historical treasures, as well as devotionals to great ancestors. These complexes serve as a means for one generation to pass down information to the next, before the advent of writing in the form of rituals, stories, and traditions such as masquerades, all of which have an association with the community shrine. And the third is social control. As human beings begin to realize their uniqueness from each other, the Irishi served as an early courthouse. And this is important to remember for this video. When a dispute arose between two people, they would settle it amongst each other. If they cannot reach a consensus, they would take the case to a mutual elder, to a family head if they are siblings, or to a council of elders if they are distant relatives, or community elders if they are from the same town. If the human elements cannot help them reach a resolution, they would take the dispute to an Irishi as a last resort or as a court of appeal if the judgment is not satisfactory to either party. To reduce chances of bias, individuals would visit the Irishi of a neighboring town, rather than their own, where they can get judgment without the hindrance of prior relationships. The Irishi concept also features a common trait in Igbo cosmology, which is the idea of using only what works. If an Irishi is said to have a certain power or ability and this proves to be true, individuals from neighboring communities would choose to visit that working Irishi. If the claims around the Irishi prove to be false, they are abandoned and the patronage drops. For this reason, a spiritual free market developed. Some shrines thrived while others fell to the wayside. In times of war, one group would go to a particular Irishi and their enemy would go to another for preliminary protection. Once it was over, the victorious side's Irishi would then grow in popularity and gain more patronage while the losing side would lose its credibility. Knowing this is important for understanding one of the most important Irishi in ancient Igbo land, according to Igbo cosmology. And this shrine goes by the name of Ishiume, which was used to channel Nechuku or Neka, also located in Uturu, Uguele, where the Stone Age spears were found. Through successfully channeling Nechuku, Ishiume became a primary focal point for channeling the divine feminine power of the universe. According to the stories of the Uturu people, Nechuku was the most powerful and sought after Arushi of all. People from around the known world would make pilgrimages to Nechuku to settle major disputes and answer major questions of the universe and human affairs. This oracle was unique in that it gifted its visitors with tools for hunting, primarily spears and axes of the finest quality that the time had to offer. Once activated, judgment by the shrine was swift and final, and like many Irishi in the ancient eras, a guilty verdict could result in death, and fear of this would prompt individuals to admit guilt prior to going to the Irishi, though the extent of the judgment can only be speculated based on related evidence for this particular shrine. Nechuku, like most Irishi, was more than a shrine, altar, or temple. Nechuku at Uturu was an entire complex, which not only involved erecting physical structures, and groves of sacred trees. The shrine also included living elements, most popular of which is the python. The python served Nechuku as it did other Arushi in the area of central Igbo land, as a messenger. When it appeared in places it was not supposed to, or visited the homes of individuals, it was a sign that the individual was being summoned by the Arushi for one reason or another. The python, because it was part of the greater apparatus of the Arushi, was treated as equal to a human being, or above as it was seen as equal to human beings of great honor. For example, if pythons are killed by a human being, punishment for that human being would be equal to the punishment of killing their fellow man within that same community. If a python enters an individual's home, they are greeted and treated as a dignified guest, offered to join in meals, and even offered a bed to stay in for the night, if need be. If a python is seen on the road, they are greeted like an elder or a citizen of the community. And this is because in order for the Arushi to work, all of the elements that were present in its creation and activation have to be there. In order to activate the Arushi, or turn on the machine, as you would, an exact simulation of events that took place when the Arushi was first created must be done. And to understand the significance of this, we have to understand how an Arushi is activated to begin with. When a group of people settle into a land, they would ask the Abara of the earth to allow them to call that land home. This is the spirit of Anna, the Earth Mother or Earth itself. Once the plead is made, the founder of the community then makes a set of promises to the spirit in the form of laws designed to keep human beings from desecrating the holiness of the land. These promises are known as Iwa, and they're often a fairly simple, consistent base of rules that the other laws of the community are built on. Once the promises are made, the Arushi is then built. The Arushi is then brought to life by way of a sacrifice. 
The sacrifice is most often the blood of an animal, such as a goat or a chicken, sometimes the yolk of an egg or the pulp or sap of a sacred tree. Rarely, but still important and common enough to be of note, human blood or human sacrifice is also used to activate some arushi. Once the proper sacrifice is made to the arushi and performed properly through trial and error, the arushi is activated. And every single time an individual wishes to activate that arushi again, the exact same sacrifice and sequence must be done. But the sacrifice itself is only a part of the greater simulation of the original activating element. In order for things to be done exactly how they were done the first time, the individual who activated the arushi must also be present to perform the activating ceremony, as this rite cannot be passed to anybody but that individual. Because thousands of years have passed since the activation of many Arushi, such as Nechuku of Utsuru, the individuals who activated the Arushi throughout Igbo land are more than likely dead. So, as a substitute for the individual's presence, the first son of the family, or the Diotbara, also works, and then his first son, and so forth, as the first son stands as the representative of the ancestor who founded a family. As their representative, the individual is given an offal, or a staff of authority, which is passed down from generation to generation and allows individuals to stand in for their ancestors, as the offal possesses their mua, or spiritual remnants. If you think of an Arashi again as a computer, and the ritual, a password sequence necessary to turn it on, similar to an on button, and then for full access, there's a fingerprint scan which is similar to the descendant of the original founder needing to be present, or the rightful heir of the individual's awful after their death. The descendants of this first son are known as the Osu of the Arushi. The Osu of the Arushi are a part of the greater Arushi complex similar to the Python, the sacred trees or sacred objects cited before, and are afforded the same respect and privilege, as they are in fact considered a part of the machine itself. Like the python, the osu live near the arushi, and there's a list of rituals that cannot be performed without participation of this individual. Like the python and the agbara itself, the osu of the community cannot be assaulted, insulted, commanded, or challenged by anyone in the community and beyond. If an osu enters your farm and takes your food, you cannot object. If an osu enters your home and takes objects, Objects, the same. The Osu cannot go to war or have war waged on them. And this reality is not only acknowledged in the community, but by everyone in Igbo culture as a whole. Because of this spiritual immunity, Osu are able to travel from community to community on behalf of the Arushi, cleansing abomination, which are violations of the original promises made to the Arushi, which is a function that cannot be performed by ordinary people. The Osu in this case acts as a mediator between the people and the shrine, or as a walking shrine in themselves. In every community that acknowledges the practice, the Osu form a small, spiritually connected group that are separate from the Diala, or the secular citizens of the community. In Igbo cosmology, all things are distinguished between spiritual and physical. And to further understand what this means, we have to look at how Igbo society is organized as a whole. The primary ethical principle in Igbo society is Republican egalitarianism. This is a means of organizing a society into constituent parts and maintaining a balance and separation of powers between them. In this system, government is organized in two bodies, the umunna, or government of men, and the umwada, or the government of women. To balance powers between the genders, men made rules and settled disputes concerning men, and women made rules and settled disputes concerning women. Each gender was then allotted its own world within the community. For example, rules and judgments about land and farming fell in the area of men, and making rules or judgments about markets and commerce fell in the area of women. And theoretically, this creates balance through interdependence. For example, if a man was a farmer, as was the presumed majority occupation of the time, he could not sell his produce without first being married, as only his wife can participate in the market. If a woman wants to begin her career in business, she would need a husband, as only he can allot the necessary land for farming. Various crafts fell into the hands of the different gender world. Men formed unions and guilds where they would pass down trade secrets amongst each other, and women did the same for theirs. The government of men could only exact taxes on men, and the government of women exacted taxes on women. This principle not only existed within a community, but governed how communities interacted with each other as a whole. And the best example is the market day system. Around each arashi, a central market is built, placing the most important elements of a community, the shrine, the osu community, and the community market within the same area. Each market then bears the name of one of the days of the week. And in the Igbo lunar calendar, known as Iguafo, a week consists of four days. Eke, Orie, Hafo, and Ngwo. On the day of your market, the women of the surrounding three communities and beyond will converge to sell goods in your community market. 
So for example, I'm from the community of Umokwe, the town of Awomama. My community market is Nkwa, and our shrine just behind the market is Njaba Nkwa. On the fourth market day, which is also Nkwa, communities would gather at our market to sell goods. And this included women from the Eke, Ori, and Afo markets of other communities. On the next day, which is Eke, they would go to the market of the Eke hosting community, then the Ori and the Afo until it finally returns to Nkwa. This is designed not only to unite surrounding communities through interdependence, but to create a situation where wealth and therefore power is balanced between all parties. This gave rise to a unique situation where Igbo land became a dense cluster of thousands of communities, relatively equal in size and ability. Now this system of organization that I've described is the world of the Diala. And because the wealth and responsibilities of the secular world were given to the Diala, the wealth and responsibilities of the spiritual world were given to the Osu, with both ends restricted in their access of that not allotted to them. The Osu existed as a spiritual community within a town. There's evidence to point to the fact that in early Igbo history, the Osu did not participate in the market, nor farming, as today it is considered taboo to buy from stalls owned by Osu women. And many communities have built Osu markets, where only Osu women sell their goods, and Osu people buy from in very recent history. By all evidence appearing to be a modern phenomenon, these markets arose between the 1950s and the end of the colonial era. And towards the end of the video, you will find out why, as this is central to my theory of who the Osu are and how the system came to be. As a means of earning, the Osu were paid to perform rituals that only they could activate. They also received all payments in the form of sacrifice to the shrine. And because the shrine existed in a free market fashion, the Osu often became richer than the surrounding population and communities with successful shrines, which prompted many of the Diala to join their ranks. And from this we see that there are Osu who are not direct descendants of the shrine's founder, where the founding lineage served as a leadership of the Osu community as a whole, and head administrator for rituals tied to the activation of the Arishi. So when you receive the answer that the Osu are priests of a shrine or a priestly lineage, there is an element of truth within it. While there is an element of truth to the idea of the Osu being priests, or a priestly caste, there is no other culture in the world that treats its priestly caste with discrimination or acts of disenfranchisement, exclusion, and a regard of inferiority or contempt. In most cultures, and even in caste systems, the priestly order is usually placed at the top of the social hierarchy, or somewhere near it, and this told me that I had to look further for answers on the subject. If you look at cultures surrounding the Igbo, such as the Bini, with their famous Bini Empire headed by an Oba, there are striking contrasts and parallels. The rules that govern the conduct of the Oba are identical to the rules that govern the conduct of the Osu. For example, the Oba cannot eat with common people, or be seen eating by them, and the Oba is the individual with the spiritual fingerprint to activate the powers of the Arishi of the community, or the Orisha as it is known in that community. And the Oba himself is regarded as a living embodiment of the ruling spirits of the people, whose mere presence has supernatural implications. And these spiritual and social rules extend to the ruling classes of various communities in coastal West Africa. But unlike the Osu, they are not outcasted. In fact, they are regarded, or their titles are directly translated as king, emperor, or ruler in the societies they live in. Which brings us to the next answer you'll get when you're asked a question of what is an Osu, and the next question we need to examine. Are the Osu outcasts? An outcast is an individual who has been rejected by a society or social group. As it relates to the Osu, author Chinua Achebe is quoted saying, An Osu is a person dedicated to a god, a thing set apart, a taboo forever, and his children after him. He could not marry, nor be married to a freeborn. He was in fact an outcast, living in a special area in his village, close to the great shrine. Wherever he went, he carried with him a mark of his forbidden caste. Long, tangled, and dirty hair. A razor was taboo to him. And Osu could not attend the assembly of the freeborn, and in turn cannot be sheltered under his roof. He could not take any of the titles of the clan. And when he died, he was buried with his own in a kind of evil forest. In today's society, marriage between Diala and Osu is strictly discouraged or outright forbidden, as the spouse of the person considered Osu and their children thereafter would then gain the status of Osu. It is believed that if an individual who is considered Osu is in stress and runs into the home of a non-Osu, the non-Osu becomes Osu, forgiving the individual refuge. If a person considered Osu breaks a kolonut, which is done at the beginning of all Igbo gatherings by the eldest man in the room to signify peace among the people in attendance, 
and togetherness with ancestral spirits, then everyone in the room is liable to become Osu. If someone who is considered Diala sleeps with someone who is considered Osu, they themselves become Osu, and even showing overt kindness or friendship may cause a person to switch status from Diala to Osu in many communities. For this reason, especially in the recent past, all interaction between both groups is strictly avoided, unless necessary, such as ceremonies within the shrine. Today, many Osu, when identified, fall victim to a web of discriminatory restriction that, as we've seen in the previous letter, can lead to suicide or even communal clashes. Many Osu opt to never return to their native community where identification is possible, as there's no other way of knowing whether somebody is Osu or Diala without knowing an individual's ancestral history within their own community. So how does a supposedly priestly caste reach this level of outcasting in contemporary time? And is this a natural feature of the system, or are we looking at something else entirely? In trying to answer this question, I ran into the paradox that many run into when studying or discussing the topic. The prevalence of Diala, who named their children Osu. Many Diala in the pre-contemporary era gave their children names such as Wosu, child of an Osu, Osuama, Osu of the land or town, Osuofia, Osu of the forest. There are Osu names tied to the sacred market days, such as Osueke, Osuafo, Osurie, and Osunquo. There are Osu names tied to the Abara of the community, donned by individuals who are not Osuarishi. And then there are Osu names tied to divinities, such as Osuigwe, Osuala, Osuchuku, and Osuago. There's also a set of honorific titles, which can also become names, that individuals earn to establish mastery of a craft, such as Osuji, the Osu of agriculture, Osuogun, the Osu of medicine, science, Osunka, the Osu of smithing or craftwork, Osunta, the Osu of hunting, Osuebwe, the Osu of guns or marksmanship. These names are bore more often by non-Osu than Osu themselves, and this concept would lead to the idea of the Osu being a celebrated class, as affirmed in a study conducted by Delta State University, where a researcher, Namani Black, is quoted saying, evidence suggests that the Osu were originally a class regarded with respect and honor, apparently because they belonged to the gods. Naming children Osu was last in vogue before the Biafran War between the 1930s and the 1950s, eventually fading out or losing fashion by the 1970s after the Biafran War, as people ceased to add Osu to their children's names. During the short period of British administration in Igbo land, which itself ended in the 1950s, and began in the 1920s in earnest, after the consolidation of the central Igbo land communities into the British Empire, individuals were made to take last names, a practice that was before that time not a part of the regular cultural nomenclature. For this reason, many people have Osu in their last name, who are not Osu, but are instead the descendants of individuals who wore the secular version of the title in their name. Understanding where the change came from and why the name fell out of favor is core to my mission of understanding the system as a whole. And to do this, we have to look at another form of Osu, the form that people up to the modern era were proud to call themselves. And that is the Osu associated with expertise. The quiet countryside town of Lejai Enugu, a set of 800 iron slags, are examined by teams of archaeologists by request of locals. What is found matches a similar phenomenon in the neighboring community of Opi, among other sites in the area. The structures were brought to the attention of the wider academic world by Donald Dean Hartle, who cited the pottery and slag clusters of the area as something of note and in need of further study, but abandoned the project soon after. Years later, researchers revitalized the efforts to investigate the site by carbon dating the 800 iron slags. At the end of this project, it was revealed that the area in what is today Leja dates back to a period between 3000 and 2000 BC and was a site of regular iron refinement on a massive scale in a time that such did not exist elsewhere in the world. This iron smelting operation lasted centuries, spreading into neighboring communities such as Opi, whose own structure dates back to 700 BC, roughly 1,300 years after the initial site at Leja was at peak operation. The slags themselves were the produce of the smelting process, where the crude remains are separated from the pure iron in refinement. For context, the time between 3000 and 2000 BC, where most of the slags were established, was a time of great change all over the world. This is the beginning of the Bronze Age in China and 1,000 years before the beginning of the Bronze Age in the rest of Eurasia and North Africa. In this era, we see the founding of the Egyptian Middle Kingdom. In North America, Native Americans begin to refine copper, Sumerians begin to build their first cities, and Stonehenge is cited to be founded centuries after this. This was the era that saw the building of the Great Pyramids, 
And as a whole, this era predates the events of the Bible, or the Hebrew Torah, by 2,000 years. The method of smelting that has survived in Igbo land today is the lost wax technique, a method of smelting by utilizing the creation of a mold from another substance, such as clay or wood, then pressing wax onto the figure. The mold would then be separated from the wax, forming an imprint to be covered and baked in a furnace, like the ones that produced the slags 5,000 years ago. Once baked, the wax would melt away, leaving molten iron to inherit its previous form. Till this day, this area of Alibo hosts the Omabe Society, a guild of initiated men whose spiritually coded practices protect, preserve, and pass down ironworking secrets within the communities they see themselves in. And evidence of the society's connection to ironwork can be seen in the masquerades it uses to display its presence in a host community. Omabe is an example of a masquerade society. Masquerade societies are unions of individuals, typically men, who form a tradition around a particular concept, spirit, or intention. Often these societies hold secrets reserved for members that go through various levels of initiation and membership. At times they resemble a trade school, other times a political party, and most often a fraternity or sorority of powerful individuals. To display the power of their craft and pass on lessons about their history and internal ideology, or display the value of their institutions to the society as a whole, they devise masquerades to display to the public at set times of the year. What is even more interesting is that during these times of the year, in many communities, the masquerade society can also form the government, especially if they're the holders of ritual secret necessary for activating certain events during a time period, such as the planting season or harvest. To the members of the society, Leja, home of the 5,000-year-old iron slags, is venerated with the title Leja Onishi Omabe, or Leja, the leader of Omabe. What is interesting about these masquerade societies is that throughout Igbo land, it is difficult, if not impossible, to find one that allows members of the Usu class to join. And why not? Smithing gave Diala communities advantages over their neighbors. They could develop more effective deadly weapons, jewelry, and high-quality, long-lasting ritual items. Though it is uncertain when these communities developed, or even if there is a correlation in time to their development, over the years, certain communities began to specialize in certain crafts. Communities such as Oka, Nkwere, Leja, Opi, Mbano, Mbowo, Etiti, and others quickly became known as ironsmithing communities. They formed secret guilds, as well as shrines dedicated to extracting spiritual inspiration, as well as developing codes of conduct among members. And again, in most of these communities, you will find that most are welcome to join the masquerade societies within the town, except the Osu Arushi. Upon the death of prominent members of the community or members of the masquerade society, the masquerade of that society will appear at the funeral to pay respects, except if an individual is Osu. Outside of barring membership of the Osu Arushi, many of these societies barred the Osu Arushi from witnessing their displays altogether. This calls back to the idea of separation of powers, though this time with a twist. Men governed the land, women governed the market, the ally governed the secular, and the Osu governed the spiritual. And the development of these masquerade societies presented a glitch in the system. Over time, these traditions and crafts made their patrons wealthy and powerful. The prestige of titles such as Osuji, the Osu of Yam, Osunka, the Osu of Smithing, Osuogun, the Osu of Medicine, lived on to the modern era. And many of these titles are attached to the masquerade societies, or title societies, that designate expertise within a certain endeavor. Free from the market structure of women, secular craftspeople can spread where they can find customers and operate all hours of the day, on any market day they choose. It is difficult to date when the specialization began, but what it presented was a growth in the world of the Diala that had no equivalent in the world of the Osu as well as what may have been an appropriation of certain cultural aspects specific to the Osu in order to garner the reverence or institutional authority reserved to the group. At the same time, perhaps it was not an appropriation, but within the normal bounds of use for the word itself. As the word Osu is used to describe somebody who is devoted to or an expert of a particular area, and therefore being Wosu, the child of an Osu, in this respect can also signify that one is the child of a founder, genius, or scholar, as well as a devotee to a certain spirit. And this aspect of the word found great use in navigating the relationship between spirits and human beings when it came to naming children. Because the Osu Arushi are a part of the larger shrine complex itself, an offense against them is offense against the supreme spirits of the Igbo pantheon, Anan, the Earth Mother, who the Osu channel their rituals towards. 
To protect children from malicious spirits, simply naming a child Wu Su has an added and often primary effect in causing the spirit to fear and respect the child. This in itself was seen as a remedy for infant mortality or misfortune on behalf of the parents, as having an Osu in the household will not only ward off malicious spirits causing the issues, but also court favor and blessings from the Earth Mother herself. This reverence for the Earth, whose wrath is often the most brutal and unwavering in the entire pantheon, is inherited by the Osu Arishi as it is the root of much of the avoidance and discrimination they faced in the past. Evidence shows that a reverent fear, rather than a regard of inferiority, may be at the root of the interaction rules between Diala and Osu. This reverent fear, as well as the prestige of being a founder, devotee or inventor, or even a blessed person, was either appropriated by the Diala institutions, such as the masquerade and title societies, or predates the two-world system altogether. But by understanding the word itself, and how it's used in other places, we can see that the outcasting does not come from the word osu, but rather what an individual is an osu of. Osu is a compound of two words, o and su, and like most nouns in the Igbo language, it is verb-based, as most things are named after the function they serve or their action characteristic. Most nouns are therefore a compound of prefix and suffix, the suffix in this case being the verb, and the prefix telling the state of the verb, which combine to give birth to a new word. For example, we can take the word ri, which means to eat. When we add n, it becomes nri, which is food. By adding e, it becomes eri, which is eating. With osu, the forming verb is the word su, and while it's hotly debated, the verb su, with this inflection, means activate, or the process of applying the property of the subject of the sentence. For example, isu jioku means to apply fire to the yam. Isu jimmi means to douse the yam in water, or to make it wet. Returning to the word osu, the prefix o in its singular subjective form applies to mean he, she, or it. And when placed together, the word can be accurately translated to activator, or person or thing that activates. And therefore, today, the outcasting or discrimination is more closely linked to what is being activated rather than the status of being an activator itself. Meanwhile, this shows how the name can be transposed before and after various words become titles of honor without its more dreaded spiritual implications. And this is important to understand because often we fail to discuss the meaning of the word osu on its own, since most discussion is more concerned with how the word feels or how the word is regarded in the modern context. But in this example, as well as many others, we can see that regard does not equate meaning. So when asked if osu means outcast, the answer is no. Outcasting is the reaction or regard that has been placed on the title. And from the example of the masquerade societies, we see how outcasting developed as an unchecked side effect to an already flawed system. As the world of the Diala began to grow, the institutions that created power and authority within that world gave birth to a culture within themselves to keep the newfound powers within a single fold. A system seemingly designed to keep power from hemorrhaging in one place over another became the perfect incubator for exactly such to happen, especially when the hemorrhaging benefited the majority citizens of the land. But every example I've given, be it that the Osu are the founders and activators of a shrine, or that the Osu introduced or have exclusive rights to a craft, or even the name Osu being given to a child to court protection, blessing, and favor, all have something in common. They're all exalted. They're all marks of merit, favor, or status. So the next question is, why is there a consistent link between the osu and the institution of slavery? When you ask what an osu is, one of the most common answers you'll receive, and the final one we'll examine, is that the osu are descendants of slaves. Also related, and perhaps more informed, is the notion that the osu are the slaves of a shrine, or a cult slave as they're regarded. And before I go into this, there's an important distinction that needs to be made. The idea that the Osu are the descendants of slaves, or slaves of the shrine, has origins in both truth and misconception. When discussing the Osu system today, we often refer to the whole thing as the Ohu Osu caste system. Or when you ask about Osu, you often begin a conversation about the titles Osu, Ume, and Ohu. So who are these other groups? Ohu is an Igbo word for slave, and is an entirely separate concept from the concept of Osu. For example, as I've said before, an Osu cannot be made subservient to a non-Osu, and as we've seen in previous examples, most social duties and rules surrounding Osu point to a position of exalted status, or a level of separation that would make slavery impossible between one and the other. While Ohu live with and near their masters, cohabiting between Osu and Diala from time immemorial has always been strictly forbidden. The other label that we often link to Osu when the discussion about the Osu Ohu caste system begins is the title of Ume. Every community that believes in Ume has a different answer as to what Ume is. 
For example, some say that the Ume are living sacrifices. As stated earlier, some Irishi require human sacrifices in order to activate, as this was the sacrifice first made when the powers of the Irishi was activated. As time went on, the practice of human sacrifice seemed to fall out of favor and was replaced with the practice of living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is done by ritually transmuting the sins or abominations committed by a community onto a sacrificial animal. The animal is then sacrificed and a single individual, sometimes voluntarily, but more than likely most often against their own will, was made to eat the meat of the animal, placing the sin within their body and making them one with it. In some communities, this person or their ancestors are considered ume. Unlike the osu, there is no place for the ume in the spiritual or ritual activities of a community. And while they're often avoided like the Osu, separation between Ume and everybody else is more subjective and not reinforced by anything cultural or legal in the pre-colonial context, as the status of Ume does not spread onto another person, nor are they protected by a particular Arushi. In other communities, they are more severely isolated than the Osu, while in some they are well integrated. The Ume status in other communities is also a name or a label placed onto families with generations of what the community considers bad or subversive behavior. In these communities, ume is often used as an insult for somebody with a generally bad character. It is my personal belief that all of these groups are grouped together when the conversation of what osu is arises to say people who are discriminated against. And as many of these conversations, especially in the academic level, are geared towards finding a solution or a means of eradicating that discrimination, this intention leads to a false grouping of all terms into one. The end result is when you ask about the osu, the answer you may get is a description of ume. When you ask about ume, the description you may get is that of the osu, and so forth. Often, the answer you'll get becomes a contradictory mismatch of all three terms, at a great disservice to finding the truth. We are now in the late Middle Ages, what is considered the Islamic Golden Age. The Muslim conquest of North Africa and subsequent Islamization of the region brought radical change to the whole of West Africa. A state by the name of Wagadu in what is now Mauritania and Mali begins to flourish as the introduction of the camel links them to the Muslim-dominated Mediterranean. This state grows to be what is today called the Ghana Empire and is one of many successive states which would develop vast empires in this region, partly due to their link to the Islamic caliphates that stretched from India to Spain. For the arid Sahel of West Africa, access to powerful new trade partners inevitably separated the conquerors from the conquered and ensured access to foreign weapons such as horses, camels, and crossbows in conjunction to the wealth of the wider world as well as the spread of Islam. The price, the much coveted gold of West Africa, the region's vast supplies of salt, and most importantly, the global trade in captured human beings, stripped of their identity, taken from their homes at blade point, and marched barefoot for weeks across the most unforgiving desert known to mankind. In response to this new demand, those who were geographically positioned to take advantage of this new trade as middlemen began to emerge as warlike empires. After Ghana came Mali, then the Aousa city-states, and many more, until the balance of power in West Africa had shifted north. The closer you were to the Sahara, the more access to global trade you had in this era, and therefore the more powerful you can become, as empires of the north most often sought slaves in the south, especially from communities that had not converted to Islam, and this is where Ndibo are affected. In the north of Ibo land, particularly those in the northeast region, slave raids from the northern middle belt put pressure on society for safety. As a remedy, many in the Unsuka region, which included the iron sites of Leja cited before, engaged in a practice that became common on the northern borders of Iboland. One of the ways devised to protect against slave raids was the establishment of Ohu border communities. Rather than leaving your community open to slave raids, the plan was to build a decoy community between your community and the north where the raiders were coming from and populating the community with slaves from the inland slave markets. This created a dynamic unlike other places in Igbo land, where some communities till this day are considered Ohu, or slave descendants, and the others free, or the descendants of those who set up the sacrificial communities. As a result, raiders would attack the slave community first, and this would give the free community time to prepare for battle or reduce cause for alarm since the northern raiders were getting what they wanted. It is important to note that the communities on the borders of what is today considered Igbo land did not practice the Osu system. It is difficult to find communities west of the Niger in the northeast region cited earlier, or among the Cross River Igbo with this practice. And therefore, to best understand the Osu system, it is important to know where the practice is endemic to. The Osu system is nearly exclusive to the core of Alibo. Most intensely, the access between Okigwe, which is a walk away from the Nechuku Shrine at Uguele, and Mbise, 
This area features the most dense concentration of communities that practice the Osu system. And as one pans away from this area, belief or practice in the system seems to dissipate. So while the Northeast Igbo of today do not practice the Osu system as commonly as others, the establishment of decoy slave communities created a split between the descendants of slaves and those not considered such. And this buffer inherited a level of separation and discrimination that mirrors the Osu system in central Igbo land, but is not exactly the same thing. West of the Niger River, the state of Benin was born in this era, and this state would grow to be one of the most influential powers in the region for years to come. But this rise did not begin until a shift happened. By the 1430s, the Portuguese and Spanish of the Iberian Peninsula had regained their freedom, pushing their former Muslim rulers out of the Iberian Peninsula and back onto the African continent. The Islamic Golden Age was over, a decline that was triggered by the collapse of Baghdad in the hands of the Mongols 200 years prior and the subsequent balkanization of the once united Islamic world. As the Islamic states grew smaller and weaker, their wealth and influence reduced, making them less lucrative partners in trade, religion, and politics. As a result, decline in the states supported by trade with the Muslim world began. The slave raiding kingdoms and empires of the Sahel began to splinter. The Mali Empire fell into decline as its vassal states began to gain their freedom, and the slave raiding middle belt of Nigeria began to fall into obscurity. But for Igbo land, the dangers of the slave trade were set to go from bad to far worse. The United Muslim Empires of the Mediterranean created a link between distant regions of the world. So when the Spanish and Portuguese declared war on them and established independence, they found themselves cut off from the wealth of Africa, China, India, the Middle East, and most of the Mediterranean. With the Muslim world in decline and a severed relationship, Spain and Portugal grew desperate for alternative trade routes to free them from dependence on their Muslim enemies. So in 1490, when an equally desperate Italian trader by the name of Christopher Columbus proposed a route to India that didn't require crossing hostile Muslim territory, the Spanish crown issued a great loan and accepted his wager. As is famously understood, Columbus failed to reach India, but instead landed in the Caribbean. And upon realizing he wouldn't be able to repay the loan through ordinary trade, Columbus hatched a new plan. He and his crew were to make this trip profitable by any means necessary. Over time, a system was developed. The idea was to take as much land as possible in the name of the loan-issuing monarch in Europe and use slave labor to milk the land of every possible resource until profit was possible. After clearing land of its original population through acts of genocide, Portugal and Spain first tried enslaving the Native Americans, but their knowledge of the land and limited knowledge of commercial agriculture made it difficult. Next, they brought in Berber and Arab slaves from the recently defeated Muslim empires, which once held dominion over them. But with minimal farming experience, as many were traders, nomads, and craftspeople, the system soon became unsustainable. It was then that stories of the densely populated farming societies of West Africa gained a new ear. By the 1500s, the map of Igbo land began to change, and the events that followed would bring us to where we are today with the Osu system. Prior to the 15 and 1400s, there was next to no reason to settle the coastal Niger Delta in great number, especially for Igbo communities further inland that depended on a harvest of yam as their cash crop. The coast was relatively isolated from the bulk of economic activities in the hinterland. The land of the coastal delta was marshy and flood-prone, difficult to farm on scale or settle permanent. Those who did settle the region, such as the John Oguni, established semi-permanent marine settlements that depended on fishing as a primary source of income and trade with the more populated hinterland in exchange for boats and agricultural produce. But when migrations escalated in the late 14 and mid 1600s, none of these factors mattered. In the 1600s, a small group of Igbo settlers in the hinterland migrated to an island on the Atlantic coast. They named the new settlement Okolama, land of the curlew bird. But later European visitors would name this land Boni Island. Okolama was not alone. In the same era, the Efik people established a city which grew in prominence due to trade with the Portuguese Aquaba, which the Portuguese would later rename Calabar. What both of these settlements had in common was the building of a castle structure, similar to one built on Almina Island and Badagari Lagos. This was the new infrastructure of what would become the transatlantic slave trade. And from there, the focus shifted on enslaving Arabs and Berbers towards the enslavement of black Africans. The plan was to establish ties with coastal cities and empires and provide them with the weapons necessary to gain advantage over their neighbors. 
Relationships like this led city-states such as Benin to grow into vast empires, tapping him into the wealth and power that came from the transatlantic slave trade, making Benin City the power hub of the region. Similar to the Osu, the Oba did not directly participate in commercial activities, but instead took tribute from a legion of chiefs. But even in the city of Benin, something interesting began to happen. A European visitor to Benin noted a story that was circulating of a civil uprising that happened years before his visit. The story was that the Oba had become angry, that the nobles and the traders had developed houses taller than his palace. He issued a decree that any house taller than that of the Oba was to be reduced in size immediately. And according to the story, all of the chiefs that were summoned complied, except for one. This man, already incredibly wealthy, refused to reduce the height of his personal palace. As a result, he suffered the Oba's wrath. The home was burnt to the ground and he escaped within an inch of his life from the walled city of Benin. The story says that the traveler went three days on foot to the east as the story goes, the man returned with an army and waged a punitive war on Benin City, which saw his forces break through the Oba's walls and burn down a significant portion of the city until he was finally repelled by the Oba's forces. What was strange about this to me was the fact that a private individual was able to not only amass an army and challenge the Oba that he previously served under, but the location he is said to amass the army from. Like the Osu on the eastern half of the Niger River, the Oba of Benin commanded authority by way of a reverent fear of his spiritual authority. But in this story, you don't see that. Rather, you see the riches of the commercial world put into hyperdrive by the triangle trade with the Europeans and the Americas, to the point where spiritual authority was quickly being surpassed by material and commercial wealth. And this pattern would be most pronounced in the rise of the city-states of Arochuku. Around 1650, a crusade happened on the eastern end of the Niger River. A coalition of individuals who recently gained power in the new slave trade united to take over an important Ibibio city. This was the city that housed the legendary Ibini Ubabi Shrine. Spurred by the demands of the slave trade and the political, spiritual, and geographic importance of the shrine, a union of Cross River Ibos and Ephix waged a 90-year crusade to take the shrine from the Ibibio. But what was the significance of this shrine? Earlier, we spoke of Uguele and the spirits of Nechuku, whose legendary story matches the Stone Age spears found in the area. The spirit that awarded hunters with spears, and axes, and settled disputes for pilgrims far and wide, establishing itself as one of the most important shrines, if not the most important shrine in the history of the Igbo people. Millennia after its founding, Nechuku of Uguele had grown tired of the people of Uturu who housed her. As the story goes, over years their demands grew pettier and pettier, and less and less deserving of the Agbara's time and attention. In fact, one day an old woman approached the shrine to ask the shrine to help her find her missing cooking pot. It was then that Nechuku had had enough. The spirit rose from the ground she was first channeled in and lifted away from Uguele to find a new home. This new home would be Ibini Ubabi, a shrine that belonged to the Ibibio people, where she would stay never to return to Uguele again. It is difficult to say whether this event triggered what would happen next, if it was part of the inspiration for the events to come, or if the story was made up in retrospect. Either way, by the 1400s, Ibini Ubabi was considered the most powerful and effective shrine in the region, receiving visitors from as far as today's Togo. And from this, a war would begin. The coalition of crusaders who would conquer the community, united under the name of Aruchuku, the Spears of Nechuku, this multi-ethnic coalition involved Ibibios, Ibos, and Efix from the Calabar region, who were able to arm their allies from weapons acquired from the European slave traders. So for roughly 90 years, the Aros used a mixture of open warfare and internal manipulation to wage war on the Ibibio until victory was secured. The kingdom of Arochuku was founded, and while spiritual and religious reasons are given for the conquest, political as well as economic reasons, give a clearer picture as to the motivation for such a long-term, wide-scale war. Geographically, Arochuku is uniquely located at the confluence between the Igbo heartland, with its dense population of warring communities and internal slave markets. 
and the Portuguese castles built on Boney Island and Calabar respectively, and control of this community would mean a monopoly on the crossroads between the hinterland and the lands of no return. As a result, the community primarily dedicated itself to monopolizing the slave trade, and with the legitimizing factor of the Chuku Oracle, as well as an abundance of foreign goods, association with Arochuku meant wealth for the Diala and the hinterland and beyond an association centered around the selling, raiding, and capture of human beings in neighboring communities. In the 1730s, Europeans shifted their focus on what was known as the Slave Coast to the Bight of Biafra, causing the Bini Empire to begin declining. At this point, Arochuku entered a golden age, establishing settlements within Igbo land and coordinating slave raids into the interior. In central Igbo land, the primary target of the slave trade and where the Osu practice is most common, Constant warfare and the risk of being abducted overnight led to a new social dynamic. As the Osu were exempt from enslavement, people ran to the shrines of the region in droves to become Osu. Communities would go to war, and when one was defeated, the women and children, elderly and surviving men, would declare themselves Osu to gain permanent immunity from the prospect of being sold into a white man's land. Researcher G.T. Basden wrote in 1966, their numbers expanded and their status deteriorated dramatically, as that they had become outcast, feared and despised, even abhorred. Many ran to communities that was not originally their own and declared themselves Osu in their new homes. As a result, the status of the Osu, likely candidates for descendants of the town's founders, became a title associated with strangers, refugees, and foreigners. It is important to remember that before this point, there was no Igbo identity. While there was a vaguely shared language, customs, and culture, every community regarded itself as its own country. And fleeing people from neighboring communities that saw refuge in your community shrine was seldom seen as a group of brothers in need, but rather an influx of foreign refugees. To compound political issues, the idea of foreigners having the amount of social leverage granted to the Osu in the community became upsetting to many. The Diala, with their increased wealth, began to seek non-spiritual solutions and leverage in order to distance power from the hands of the Osu. As the world of the Diala grew and the shrines of central Iboland became refugee centers, any semblance of power sharing between the two ways began to fall to the wayside as warfare and international commerce hemorrhaged power further into the hands of those most positioned to take advantage of it. In this era, hundreds of communities were burned, and their scattered citizens were tasked with starting new ones to escape capture. As a result, the world of the Diala became more associated with citizenship, status, and power, and the world of the Osu became the opposite. And in this era, you find stories of several individuals taking advantage of this dynamic to weaken their internal political enemies. In my own community, which is found in central Liboland, there's a story where men gathered to meet for Congress, and one of them had hundreds of Alpha. The Alpha, or staff of authority, is passed down from first son to first son, generation after generation, or crafted by a man once he seeks to begin a new family. Holding an Alpha was a ticket for participation in community government, as each Alpha represented a vote, or a level of status when speaking. As the story goes, in my own community, there was a man with hundreds of Alpha, and every time they gathered to make decisions, his voice was supreme. When resources, food, or land was being shared within a community, he received the lion's share, until one day his peers had had enough. An assembly was summoned for the sake of designating an Usu for the newly established village shrine. As usual, a man with hundreds of Alpha arrived, ready to give his input into the decision, and then, in perfect coordination, the rest of the men in the Congress agreed that everyone must lay down their offal, and the person who picks up their offal last would become the Osu. The ambush was clear, as others quickly picked up their one, two, three, four, and five offal. The man with hundreds of offal scrambled to pick up his wealth of ancestral authority. And since he was last to complete the task, till this day his descendants have been designated the Osu within my own community, barred from the peristals of power and belonging within their own community. In my research, I found similar stories scattered throughout central Igbo land, as well as a consistent description of the Osu system being the byproduct of jealousy. Stories of individuals who owned more land than others being approached and told that he would be kidnapped at night, and then falling for the trick, declaring himself Osu for safety, only to lose his land to the would-be kidnappers. 
And throughout the history of many communities in Igbo land, you'll find similar stories to this. But one story I found particularly interesting, as it would mark the end of an era. As the contemporary age approached, the title of Osu went from being a mark of privilege and exclusivity to a shackle from the benefits of the new society. Realizing the proverbial ship was more or less sinking, many of the original Osu, or the descendants of the shrine's founders, through rituals were able to forfeit their title and become Diala. Through ceremony, these leaders of the Osu communities throughout Igbo land removed the Osu title from themselves and placed it onto others, freeing themselves from the fences being built around them while locking another person in. This trend was common and consistent, and is cited as one of the reasons that many of the Arushi in Igbo land stopped working or lost their legitimacy. Elsewhere, the Portuguese and Spanish empires that brought about the slave trade began to collapse, and in their wake, the Dutch and English wrestled them for control of the multi-billion dollar human trafficking industry, until finally the Industrial Revolution began in Britain. New machines and methods of production made slavery an unnecessary evil in the eyes of the English. Abolitionists such as Olauda Aquaino launched a campaign to devote the growing empire's power towards the abolition of the slave trade within the British Empire and on the high seas. A series of revolts and revolutions in the Caribbean, South America, and North America worked to prove that the system was an unsustainable liability that would eventually end in its host societies collapsing into war. In response to this, the British abolished the international slave trade and began to shift its focus on controlling Africa at home. The process of colonizing Igbo land was the lengthiest in the new Nigerian colony. Because each community in Igbo land was organized as a separate nation from its neighbors, the British found the situation of fighting their way through nearly impossible, or at least an inefficient use of resources and time. At first, the British hypothesized by defeating certain capitals, the whole of Igbo land could be conquered. And this led to the Aro Anglo Wars of 1901 and 1902, where after months of trench warfare against the Aro, the shrine of Chuku was destroyed by the British, and the city of Aro Chuku burnt to the ground. But unlike what the British predicted, the remaining communities, even the ones a stone's throw from Arochuku, did not acknowledge the Aro defeat as a defeat of their own. Again, faced with the impossibility of fighting hundreds, if not thousands, of disconnected wars in a strange territory, the British shifted their strategy. The method of colonization they would use would be treaty making with established authorities and by spreading compliance by way of the church, which many communities regularly welcomed to increase their development and access to foreign goods such as technology and education. By establishing churches in thousands of communities in Igbo land, the British created a new reality for the Osu. In communities where the status had diminished, many Osu were among the first to convert to the new religion, which they hoped would free them from the oppression of the previous. The Osu resisted conversion as well as compliance with the British, notorious for their general resistance of westernization. For most communities, the Diala saw the coming of the church as something that fell into their realm of influence and restricted the Osu from entering or participating in church activities further blocking them from education and even the modern hospitals being established by the churches. Church doctrine classed everything associated with Odinalandibu, the traditional cosmology of the people, as associated with the devil, an unclean, primitive, and guaranteed means towards damnation for anyone that participates. The Igbo language, way of dressing, use of traditional medicine, or any custom that did not benefit the colonial administration, including masquerades and some masquerade societies, were marked as evil or sacrilege to the church faithful. Very often, the wealthier in society resisted conversion as much of their status was tied to the status quo. Others eagerly sent their children to churches for baptism, as this was a ticket for accessing the education of the modern world. And in this education process, children were taught to read and write in the English language, making them eligible for work in the formal sector of the colonial Nigerian world. And once again, the balance of power began to flip on its head. The poor of yesterday became the rich of the day, as usefulness to the colonial administration and a willingness to adapt was directly linked to an individual's earning potential. As fully converted, English-speaking children became adults, they were first in line to become administrators and clerks in a burgeoning new upper class. And as a result, parents of all classes rushed to fill schools and churches with their own children. As their power became further entrenched, zealous church converts and Western-educated evangelical pastors began a tradition of asserting their dedication to the church by burning their community arushi and tearing apart ancient shrines. 
Names associated with the previous way of living, such as Osuigwe, fell out of favor for Christianized names. With heavy use of the words Chi and Chuku, churches held ceremonies where individuals forfeited their offal, and many of these were shipped to Europe and America, and sold as museum pieces or exotic decor among the wealthy. The Osu, being the living embodiment of the shrine, and in all regards its owner, became a cast of untouchables. As a result, many left the communities where they could be identified as Osu to resettle in rapidly modernized cities, now majority Christian and no longer held by ancient obligation, the Osu began establishing their own markets, and many were able to win autonomy for their sections of town, creating new towns on their own. And as many shrines fell into history, some remained and even grew stronger. The Arushi system, as I stated earlier, functions as a market. Shrines that proved to be the most effective in channeling a spirit become more popular than others, and more sought after as a result. Today, like Chuku of Aro Chuku before and Ne Chuku of Uguele, Ogugu has become a nerve center for medicinal, judicial, and spiritual work. Ogungu, the famous shrine located in the community of Okija. Alive and well, this shrine has become a supreme court for many and the final destination for disputes that cannot be resolved otherwise. So every year, like the great shrines of the past, many travel from far and wide to Okija to interface with the spirit of the land, the same community where a letter was found next to the bodies of two young lovers, one considered Osu and the other considered Diala. Today, the situation with the Osu system is optimistic. Generally, Igbo society as a whole is geared towards ending the distinction. Many communities have successfully integrated both classifications of people, and in these communities, intermarriage is possible, as well as common. Unlike before, young people do not regard Osu status when making friends or finding partners. As the social wall between the two collapsed in recent times, Today, shrines are administered by whoever takes interest in them, and activities once reserved to Diala are now open to all people. Many young people cannot tell you who is Osu and who is not, which itself poses a new problem. Today, the last stronghold of discrimination in the Osu system remains in marriage. When two people declare they want to get married, families will often send a spy to the in-law community to investigate the other family. Chief among their concerns is whether the proposed husband or bride is considered Osu in their native community, as well as the reputation of the individual and their family. At that point, because traditional marriage is controlled by elders, relationships fall into crisis if one of the partners proves to be from an opposing group. My theory on the subject, for the most part, is scattered throughout the video. And if you've watched up to this point, you may have a general idea of where I'm going. One thing I repeat often in my videos is the idea that Igbo culture is similar to a Russian doll model when it comes to categorizing, meaning that the same general construct used to explain the universe is the same general construct you can use to explain a family dinner. What is done on one scale is replicated elsewhere on other scales. And therefore, to understand the Osu system and form my own theory, I took a look at other places within the culture with similarities to the Osu system itself. My theory is that the Osu is to a community what the father or first son is to a community. And this can be seen in the parallel roles. This is a very rough and I, I, I mean really, really rough sketch of my extended family compound. Upon building a home and starting a family, a father is obligated to create a family shrine. At this location, he'll pray for the family and maintain a dialogue with the ancestors. He'll also keep his alpha or staff of authority that he either crafted or inherited at this shrine and do the necessary rituals for sustaining it. Typically a small sacrifice such as a chicken or the offering of libations or cola. And even without doing the sacrifice, the father of the family is obligated to pray for the family every morning. And when he passes, often his first son, or in some families, the eldest living man, will receive the alpha and carry on the legacy until he passes it to another hand. If the father of the family happens to be a Debia, he builds an ordinary shrine known as a Chi altar and a secondary shrine known as an Agun altar, dedicated to Agun, the spirit of wisdom and the Arashi of the universal mind that serves as a patron spirit and regulator for all Debia. After death, the chi altar of every individual is destroyed, and their children begin their own. But the Agun Shrine remains, and generation after generation, individuals, mainly the first son of the family, is tasked to take care of that shrine and maintain a relationship with Agun on behalf of the family, as Agun is now seen as a permanent family member within the fold. On a larger scale, the Osu serve a parallel role for the entire community. It is with little doubt that I believe that the Osu of most communities are the founders of the said community.
by way of inheritance from a very early date in our history. Another thing that points me to believe this is where the Osu are typically located in a community, which is next to the market square and the central community shrine, or in other words, right in the middle of most communities. Like most human developments, with few exceptions, growth in a human settlement starts from a central focus point and spreads outward meaning that wherever the center of a town is found, the closer you are to the reality of the founder. The buildings are older, and typically a lot of the important historical, cultural, and even spiritual sites are located at the center. It very often serves as the economic nerve center of most cities that spread in a sprawling fashion, as most Igbo villages do, and is common with most unplanned settlements around the world. And to me, I always found it strange that an outcasted group is given prime national real estate, now, within my own family, I'm the first son. Uh, my father is the first son of his father, and my grandfather the first son of my great-grandfather. And this is a very rough map of my family village, excluding uh, non-family members. Now, because I'm the first son by multiple generations, I would inherit the homes of my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather, and my great-great-grandfather who founded the village. And in this, I've highlighted the houses I would inherit in red. Note that it's only three because my great-great-grandfather's house is no longer standing. And from this general layout, you see that the center where I've circled serves as a de facto family square where everybody gathers and socializes, hosts meetings or major family functions. Now, if for some reason my family continued to proliferate throughout the map and all of the homes were filled by descendants of my great-great-grandfather, the first son of my first son of his first son would inherit the ones in the middle as well as well as the alpha of the founder of the family, and therefore be responsible for prayer for the family as a whole. This individual, often known as an ejiofo, would also serve as a family judge, hearing and settling disputes between family members, or even representing family members if the dispute cannot be settled and has to be taken to the shrine. Now, if the founder of my family village was a dibia, which he was not, he would have an agun shrine, and this would be passed down to me, or passed down to my son, similar to the alpha. This basic algorithm creates a situation where town spread from a radial point, a radial point where the first son inevitably inherits the town's center, and then serves as the spiritual authority and holder of the legacy for the family as a whole. Now, in non igbo cultures, you see this more clearly, where monarchy is common. For example, Old Benin City radiates outwards from the Palace of the Oba, who conducts the rituals and prayer necessary for keeping the family, or in this case, the city or empire, intact. The Oba also serves as a final judge in settling disputes among members of the city. And the same can be seen in the Yoruba culture, the Efik culture, and the neighboring Igala and Idoma cultures. And if you trace the history of all these places, the legitimacy of the position, as well as that of the first son, comes from being the heir of the founder of the community, and being responsible for maintaining the interface between the living and the spiritual. And like I said earlier, it is my personal theory that the Osu are the descendants of the founders of their communities, and the communities with the Osu practice likely the oldest uninterrupted settlements in the region. Like a city, the population density of Igbo land works in a sprawl model, with the communities in the center being the most densely populated, and more than likely the oldest, based on the evidence presented. Communities in the center, in conjunction with my theory, are also the ones that practice the Osu system more often than not. And as people spread outwards from a center point, the practice seems to have fallen out of favor, because once you cross the Niger River to the west, or the Cross River to the east, it is difficult to find a community that sustains the Osu system. But what you do find in these communities is monarchy, or a form of spiritual monarchy concentrated on a single individual, or a dual monarchy with one monarch serving the world of men, and another monarch serving the world of women, such as the Omu of Anyama, both with roles very similar to that of the Osu. And then you saw within the presentation what was revealed again and again through my research, the power politics of the ordinary and the spiritually favored eventually stripped the Osu of their position of power, as non-Osu were better positioned to take advantage and gain from the secular changes of society thereafter. And that's it. Uh, this is Derek O'Fodder along with The Medicine Shell. If you are still watching, I really want to thank you for your patience. I'm a little tired of talking, so this <laughs> outro will be brief. Uh, this video took a very long time for me to do, so thank you again for waiting. All of my sources and other materials on Igbo cosmology, history, and spirituality are available to my patrons to read whenever at patreon.com slash the medicine show. And I want to send a shout out to the patrons that are currently making this video possible. Mina Uchenna. Carl, Chingwe, Malcolm from New Jersey, Nama, Ubieshi, Remy Dior Martin, Vladimir Magluar, Nonso, M. Bolds, Amala, Charles C., Chimobi, Sack Alexander, 
Joseph, Kwasi Densu, Chika Akaneme, Brian Jones, Ikechuku Obioha, Taylor, Chuma, Uren Kara, Tony Ateke, Sharika Regina, T.E. Obiaya, Chinyere, Obi Everyone, Baba Wali, Mwaka, Mo, Na, Gerard Miller at Altered.Roots, Malachi Lee, The Homegirl Healer, Joyce, Ife Shola, Ajigunwa, Joseph, N.C. Okeke, Hess, Candice, Cynthia Ojibwe, Velma, Ike, Sheila, Ifunanya, B.A., Emmanuel L. Basnight, Benji B., and Nzadi Dinazi.